good evening everyone it's 5 pm and as usual we invariably try that we should be on time i on behalf of beyond law clc and ulas punjab university chandigarh welcome you all to another session during this lockdown period as we have already been saying that during these lockdown we are trying to sharpen our skills not only as a lawyer but also on the various aspects so that we can learn and become a better lawyer after the lockdown is over that we can learn many things not only in law we have held webinars on various issues which arise and are useful for any professional especially the lawyers the students the university professors directors uh, and heads of the departments in the league, legal departments and uh, universities we have done issues regarding constitution law criminal law civil law election land acquisition so on and so on we have also held webinars to the effect that how a lawyer advocate can become a better lawyer because we sometimes find that the lawyer knows the subject but on account of non presentation of the facts in the right perspective that is as we all know that for a lawyer there are three stages first is to convince the client that he is the best person to deal with the issue because once he comes for a consultation you have to convince him that yes this is the case and the, these are the gamut a uh, gamut around which the case will evolve secondly after the case is done then we have to go with the pleadings research of law so that eventually what is drafted out in the right perspective and it is filed and it is listed before the bench or the court that is the pleadings should be good enough so that when the judge when he comes to the court then since the files invariably reach the judges they have a fair idea of what the case is about and if all the facts have been placed in the right way then in that eventuality at least in the high court and supreme court it is easy and the judges invariably issue notice of motion or notice to the other side on simpliciter on the way the facts have been pleaded and once you plead you have also to take into account the statutory provisions the regulations and the law and then is once you have placed the facts properly sometimes the judge asks a query how do you place them that is called as the opening statement these all are the skills and tools as to make a lawyer from an ordinary to an extraordinary lawyer but does that require an extra effort does it require certain extra skills what are the nuances which when which which one has to have so that he can carve out his niche as we all know that there is always competition more at the bottom and from bottom to reach on the top they say you are lonely on the top and once you reach on the top it is said that sustainability is even more challenging but you start enjoying once you are on the top what are the keys to that what are the tools what are the skills for that we thought that there could not be a better person who could explain these nitty gritties so that how we should draft the case how we should make the opening statement how we should gather the and research the law and so on so on without taking much time i will ask honorable mr justice shishadri naidu who has created his niche in a short span after joining as a lawyer from official court to the high court he adorned the bench of andhra pradesh then he has been a judge in the kerala high court and now presently he is in maharashtra and in goa he has thus the knowledge of three different high courts the way in which each state and different lawyers 
assimilate the facts, research the law, do the content writing, etc. Varies also from place to place because the subject also varies from place to place. We will have insights from Honorable Mr. Justice Shadri Naidu, who has also written books. Uh, as we had said, he has written MP Jan's book. He has uh, revisited that on certain aspects. We have also heard him on an earlier occasion on pre uh, precedents. It was a yet, again, yet again an enriching session. All this entire gamut, we will just request Honorable Mr. Justice Dama Shishaydru Naidu that what is the key which makes the lawyer a lawyer to be watched upon, a lawyer who is looked upon for that particular case, whether one should specialize in one particular field, whether one should work from a Mufsil court at the initial stage or whether he should from the high court or a Supreme Court or a tribunal. He will give different perspectives which according to the team of Beyond Law, we all feel that will be quite a fascinating uh, webinar. We also know that Justice Shishadri Naidu, being a good author, good orator, judgments which have far-reaching impact on social issues, etc. Uh, without taking much time, I call upon Justice Shishadri Naidu to give his insights to all these issues and the question answer sessions. Anybody who has issues regarding any point which you ask, uh, Justice Shishadra Naidu has agreed that he will be more than happy to give his insights to the questions which are posted. So that question answer session will be around 5.50, that is around 45, 50 minutes from now. Over to you, Honorable Mr. Justice Shishadra Naidu. Welcome. Good evening, my friends across the spectrum. I have come before you twice in two weeks. I know it's one too many for you. And today's topic, as notified, is about advocacy, tools and skills, as organized by, as usual, Beyond Law CLC and Punjab University. It is essentially the auto persuasion. How come I've been here before you again within a short span of time? Let me say, Mr. Vikas Chatrath has succeeded in persuading me. So you may have to endure me for the next 45 minutes or so. You know pretty well when we have a health problem, our first option is consulting a doctor. If we don't have a doctor nearby, or if we want to draw some comfort and guidance, we may talk to a chronic patient because he grappled with the problem earlier. He knows where the shoe pinches, so to say. So I was a patient a few years ago. Like many of you, I had to grapple with the problem of how I could be successful, how I could impress the judges, and how I could carry my point across. Initially, I practiced in a district court, as we call Mufferson Coast. And I strongly believe that is where advocacy lives. The higher you move, the thinner it becomes. Not that advocacy in high courts or in the Supreme Court is a child's play. It isn't. It has its challenges, perhaps more challenges. What I mean is the advocacy at higher level misses some salient or essential features. For example, pleadings may not play a pivotal role. There's no examination of witnesses. Of course, I'm not talking about high courts of original jurisdiction. So I'll talk on the topic from the perspective of a trial court. I may be telling something which you already know. Then why should you listen? Because what is obvious is apt to be missed. Besides, repetition makes you develop 
what you call a memory muscle. You could have seen senior counsel, many a senior counsel rather, performing effortlessly. But remember that there was a lot of effort behind that effortlessness. They have been doing the same thing repeatedly for many years. That incremental accretion makes them what they are now. We all believe that somebody should have the talent and somebody should have that innate ability to learn and to perform and to excel. My friends, trust me, they're all discarded theories. Let me cite a couple of instances which I've gathered from a very wonderful book called Bounce, B-O-U-N-C-E, by Matthew Syed. From that book, I gather a couple of incidents, as I've said. One involves experienced senior nurses in a neonatal hospital. That is, the hospital where newly born are treated or taken care of. In one particular hospital in America, as the book records, the experienced nurses were able to diagnose infections in babies, even when to outsiders, including the doctors, there seemed to be no visible clues. This was not merely remarkable, but often life-saving, if you're aware. When the hospital would perform tests to check the accuracy of the nurse's diagnosis, occasionally they turned out to be negative. That means the findings wouldn't be perhaps accurate, but lo and behold, to be sure enough, by the next day, the babies would develop the symptoms as was afraid by the nurses, or predicted by the nurses. And simply put, we call it intuition, or sixth sense, or something else. But cognitive psychology debunks all these notions. Let me tell you about another classic example in the sports arena, a person called Desmond Douglas. He is supposed to be the greatest table tennis player England has ever produced. His speed of reaction and reaching out in table tennis is legendary. Let me tell you, if you are playing table tennis, somebody hits and you have to meet that one. First you wait in anticipation. Once the ball was hit, you lean backwards, make room for yourself, as they call it, and then hit the ball reverse. But this Douglas, to the naked eye it would appear, even before the opposite candidate could hit the ball, he was ready with his reaction. And he would rather lean forward instead of leaning backward and uh, return the ball. So one day he was interviewed. And he said, perhaps I have a great eye for the ball. But Matthew Said himself, a table tennis player, who after his retirement from active sports, took to journalism. He was an Olympian. And he went to this Douglas village or town. And he probed into his uh, methods of learning when he was a child. So he came from a working class suburb. And in his school, there was no table tennis. Once the school management recruited a physical director who knew a spattering of this table tennis. So he encouraged the boys there to learn the game. This Douglas and his brother came forward. But there was no enough room or facility for them to play. So the physical director made some makeshift arrangement. And a very small room, perhaps enough to accommodate the table. And only two players can stand, almost touching the wall. 
that was the size. So these, this Douglas and his brother, for five years then onwards, learned in that cramped room. You know what happened with years of exposure, he was always forced to lean forward and hit the ball. That way he developed tremendous reflexes. And to the naked eye, it appears it's a miracle of sort. If you can check and if you read Malcolm Gladwell's outliers, in America, surprisingly, all the greatest achievers were born between January and March, but not beyond perhaps April. Why? We feel that they were the luckiest months or the religiously important months. The kind, this cognitive psychology has felt that in America, the schools will have the cutoff date 31st December of any year for the child to be admitted. And it should have been completed by five years then. So somebody is being born on 1st January, he still has to wait one whole year to come to school. That means you'll be coming five years, 363 days. So a child with one fifth of his age maturity, he always tends to dominate. I believe much of time could be taken for the storytelling. I'll just cut that short with one more and we'll be back to the subject. You must have been familiar with that famous musician, German musician, Mozart. And we also believe there are child prodigies and they display remarkable qualities when they were very young. You could have seen people, children, belting out the dates of any year or the weekday, whatever, in the next 50 years to come, 100 years to come, and then listing out all capitals, all flags, all currencies, and all those things. Stupendous, rather steps you could. But science again says, prodigies are not born, they are made. You take the example of Mozart. Mozart had given his first concert when he was five or six years. Actually, he began composing pieces of violin concertos at the age of five and produced many works before he could hardly be 10 years. We must all agree that he's a child prodigy, but can you look into his life? Mozart's father was a very famous music teacher. The book he wrote on how to play violin was a standard book for teachers next 30 to 40 years. So this experience a teacher initiated his son into this game when he was three years old. By the time Mozart could come to five years, he had the practice of 3,500 hours. One guy called Michael Ho, in his book, Genius Explained, tells he's a late bloomer rather than child prodigy because it took 3,500 hours. What we had been looking at, rather, was his age than the hours he had spent. So my friends, effortlessness, seniority, quality, they're all matters well within your reach. With that one, let me tell you the limitations that I suffer when it comes to this topic. It is a vast one, you agree? And it's highly subjective. What appears to be a skill or a tool for me may not be so for you. So kindly take whatever I say with a pinch of salt and test that with your experience you have already had or experiment if you want to. And in 45 minutes, I can only talk about the road map, not the road itself, much less about the destination. But I assure you, it's not going to be stuffy or academic. I essentially will talk about my experience or what I've observed or read and learned from various sources, essentially. And 
the eternal debate is that whether advocacy is an art or science. An immediate answer could be that if at all it were to be art, it could not be taught. But some say it is a skill that can be mastered. You take breathing, which is rather second nature, we say, no, it is the first nature. It's our motor reaction. It's essential aspect of our survival. And do you think somebody is going to teach anything about a breathing? It's something like something being taught to a fish about swimming. But believe me, we have made a whole science out of it in the name of pranayama. If breathing can be taken to that level, can't we think of advocacy in the same lines? Once, a very famous personality said, be a skilled cobbler instead of a poor engineer. Then he cites in his book an example of a child, school child and about his natural propensity or preference. Suppose you want a child to study the subject which he doesn't like. He quotes this example. Provide him the comfort of an AC, the cushion, all amenities are comforts, and then ask him to read, say, mathematics, as I hate it. Then he would be profusely sweating and cursing himself. Instead, ask him to go in hard stun and play the game he likes. He would be joyously doing it. So he believes there is innate quality of people, so you can't change it. But maybe beginning from 1980s, this neuroplasticity has emerged. It has put the whole thing top to top. It has said, mind is amoral, it is valueless, it's value neutral rather. And whatever you feed to it, it takes as a master's command. So my friends, especially the young advocates, I must underline this lecture, if you call it one, is dedicated to young listeners who want to break out onto the scene. And about this play of the mind, this notion of knowledge or talent, if you want to know inside out, please read a book of good influence on you. It could be What to Say When You Talk to Yourself. It's by one author called Shad Helmstetter, is a psychologist. My friends, you have seen the greatest personalities in any walk of life. Do you really think that they've been greatest from the word go? What example can I give you other than that of Einstein? Please remember after his schooling, he wanted to pursue polytechnic. Those days, engineering was polytechnic in undivided Germany. His father was a businessman. And then this entrance, Latin was a compulsory subject. He appeared for the entrance. He was very weak in Latin. He failed. He came back. His father told him, son, why struggle with that one? Come into my trade. I'll teach you everything and you can be good at it. He was caught on the halls of dilemma, as I could put it. Then he came across one sentence by Rolf Waldo Emerson, the American statesman. That was, if you indomitably stick to your instincts, one day the world will come round to you. If you indomitably stick to your instincts, one day the world will come round to you. Then Einstein felt that his instinct was to be a heralder. That means exploring things and establishing things. So again, he stuck to it, wrote the exam next time, passed, and then made history. As I say, the rest is history. Now, anything is a matter of trial and error. So is the case with advocacy. But here the problem is, is the client's trial and the advocate's error. Well, sometimes it proves costly. 
So one has to be very wary of his trade, his tools, and his battle readiness. And believe me, the trial advocacy is a skill that can be taught. This profession is not arcane or mysterious, magical, not at all. It's a matter of skill, a matter of reading, a matter of practicing, and a matter of applying in that practice what we have learned. Our learning can be from many sources and in many ways. Please remember to use a wheel. We need not invent it. It has already been invented and used. So, my young friends, read biographies and autobiographies of great lawyers, good books and advocacy. And with that, every author's lifetime experience becomes yours in hours or days. To know that we get hurt when we fall off a building, we need not actually fall off. Ask someone who fell off. In the common law countries, the trial is not an exercise designed, please remember, to discover the truth. The court is concerned with the facts presented before it. One party affirms the facts as true. The other party denies it as false. Each is allowed to persuade the court to accept their point of view. And this process of persuasion is trial. And the procedural law fixes the boundaries and imposes conditions of these joining parties to fight and emerge a winner. In other words, suppose a man was killed. Under the common law system, the court is not expected to find out who killed. That is possible under civil or continental law. In that, judge himself investigates and conducts the trial, including the cross-examination. But in common law, the court is concerned only with one thing, whether the person brought before it as an accused did it, nothing beyond. And it begins with the presumption he did not. Friends, remember, rules of evidence are mainly designed to exclude. When you talk about either civil law or the criminal law, by the time the case comes to court, the facts freeze, the action is complete. As we call it, the cause of action has arisen and over in fact. There's nothing to be investigated either by the court or by the advocates. Advocates only try to persuade the court one way or the other. Rather, we are putting on a presentation designed to persuade. Let me begin with pleadings. A client comes to you. Don't ever give your opinion on the merits of the case he brings before you. If you want to have an authority on this proposition, you may read David Panik's book called Advocates. In that one, he tells an interesting aspect. Don't ever judge a case, he tells. Sometimes you may feel that a case is hopeless, but who knows by the time the trial is complete, it turns out to be very good. Or in his infinite wisdom, as he tells, the judge may see a point which you have failed to see. So judging is not your part. Advocacy is yours. That's what he said. And let me tell you an instance, because you may kindly appreciate one aspect. Advocacy is a matter of telling tales. So I'd be telling a few. You may endure me, or else when you feel bored, please, any of you raise your hand, I'd be stopping. Friends, when I was practicing in Tirupati, my native bar, there was an anecdote, sort of uh, tale that was doing rounds. That was about a legendary advocate whom I never saw, one Allah Radha Krishna. 
the story goes like this. One day a client came to him and he narrated the whole case to him. Senior as he was, he told him, look man, it was not my habit to tell whether a case is weak or good or strong. But I tell you, this is exceptionally good case. Be assured, we may have a positive result. So let's go ahead. Then the man said, no, sir, I don't want to go forward. Uh, I don't have enough courage for that. This time the senior counsel was, it was his turn to be surprised. He asked him why. Then the client said, until now I told you, sir, the opposite party's case. That's how it happens when you say the merits of the case. And you also know the English speaking countries, the common law countries, America being an exception, follows the rule called the cab rank rule. That means a cab driver, a licensed cab driver, cannot refuse a customer who wants a drop. And a lawyer, under the established practice and advocacy rules, cannot say no to a client unless he has a valid legally sustainable reason. Now coming to the part of pleadings, we all jump to a conclusion that the best part of advocacy is arguing. Your being articulate will determine the fate of the case. But I'm afraid that may not be entirely true. I believe advocacy is the art of listening. And listening happens at three stages. Listening to your client, listening to your opponent, listening to the judge. About the first one, you could have any number of examples. When I was practicing, hardly a couple of months into my profession, a professor came to me with no objection from a senior counsel. And he said, sir, the appeal is right for hearing. You have newly entered, and I believe you are doing well. Then my chest was swelling with pride. Somebody recognized, more so a professor. And more so a senior counsel gave his no objection. He said, sir, you should take care of this. So immediately I called up the senior counsel. I profusely thanked him. Sir, thank you very much. You have recognized me. I've been struggling. Now I'll do all my best to see that your case will have good representation because they lost in the trial court. Then the senior counsel nonchalantly said, no, no, I do. That judge, as I've come to know, always confirms the lower court's findings. So she's been pressurizing me to argue the case. Impossible to get an argument, an adjournment. Among all the advocates, you are the one who has come very recently. So do one thing. Take the vocalet, file it, and represent my lads, a new entrant, green horns sort of thing. So give me a little more time for preparation. Then he told me a secret also, the Lanny City Council. Very soon, the judge is going on leave for three months. Then some in charge court will be taken care of. I'll be arguing that. I was crestfallen, but no other go. I'm getting some money after all. I accepted it. And then, surprisingly, the landed judge did not go on leave. I was forced to argue the matter. But you know what happened in between? As it became sure that I alone should be arguing, this professor started coming to me and narrating many things. And I asked him, most of them were not found in the record. He said, with due apology to the lawyers, this is the trend in some parts of the country. Usually the seniors will say, whenever a client tries to give some feedback, who is the lawyer? You or me? Just answer me my questions. To the extent I need it, I'll ask you. To that extent, you tell. Don't narrate the whole thing beginning from the Earth's formation. That's the usual retort. He said that has happened. But I've also found he's been talking endlessly though. More so coming from teaching profession. He loves it. Then 
I was then a bit of techno savvy, as you could call. Please kindly remember, I'm no longer an advocate. I'm not marketing myself. Then what happened? I gave him a tape recorder every day whenever he would come to my house, the office rather. I asked him to speak into it and leave. Before my going to bed, I started listening to it. And I found many valuable points because he's the master of the facts. And I wouldn't have been telling this case if I had lost it. And you could as well guess the result. I won the case. So I learned my first lesson about the art of listening. And I have noticed in the trial course one peculiar aspect. I just briefly touched on it on the last occasion when I was talking about precedence. Whenever a client comes to us for a case to be filed, then we immediately start listening for a while, then we'll search for our presidential pigeonholes. It fixes where, which case resembles this one. Then the whole orientation changes. Whatever the client tells, we try to mold that into a nearest president that would uh, suit it. Take the classic example of matrimonial case. I told that about 20 years ago or so, in one instance, Supreme Court dealt with the aspect of mental cruelty. The husband pleaded that in the presence of the friends, when he invited them, the wife flew into rage, abused him, and threw the Thali, the Mangal Sutra, on his face. And court has felt it was mental cruelty. Lo and behold, next 20 years, almost in every case filed by husband about this mental cruelty and divorce, you will have that incident. With that, what happens? It's not client's story or client's fact. And we impose it on him because it gives strength to our case with a ready precedent. In the cross-examination, it frizzles out because it's our brain child, not his baby. That's the danger of pleading based on the case law. Besides, case law is uncertain. It is bound to be changed. Then what happens? We become rudderless, clueless. Friends, try to draft things as you talk in a formal way, if not a very informal, colloquial way, at least in a very informal sense, as if you were talking across. Don't use, as I feel, herein, therein, the petitioner herein, anywhere the petitioner would be talking about in the plaint, herein may not serve any purpose. All sorts of jargon and legalese can be dispensed with. That's what my belief. And if you want to have some authoritative books, there are many. The ones that I've come across and found to be useful, I may say, Pleadings Without Tears by William Rose. It's available in Kindle and also available paperback. And another book I could as well commend is Point Made by Ross Huberman. It's a very good book. He has studied the styles of very famous lawyers across the common law countries. And then he has called out the principles, what makes a brief very persuasive. And there can be any number of books. And as we are talking about tools, I'm referring to these books, not otherwise. Think of presenting in a manner that is readable. So we need, because as I had my initial beginnings with vernacular backdrop and rural backdrop, I needed to have some grammar to master. So if anybody feels, most of you may not need that one because you may have urban background and English medium exposure, but if at all, anybody feels that they are a little bit low or short in their confidence when it comes to articulation in writing, May I suggest the good old famous book, Brennan Martin's English Grammar, or Elements of Style by William Strunk and E.B. White. It's a small book of about, say, 100 pages or 120 pages. And it's ranked one of the top 100 books in nonfiction to this day. And friends, finally, I'll have a couple more books before I move on to the other aspect. Elements of Legal Style by Brian A. Garner. And two more by him. One is the winning brief. And the other one is legal writing in 
plainly. And a very vital aspect I would like to touch on here. We plead, we draft, we prepare, call it a plaint, call it a writ petition, call it an appeal, whatever, and then we file it. Maybe during the course of your cross-examination, you would like to stress on one aspect, or during the arguments, you would like to stress on one aspect. And the court feels you have not pleaded about that one. Then you know what happens? The learned judge would be asking, Mr. Counsel, have you pleaded that? Our immediate reaction would be, yes, my lads, I have pleaded about it. So you try to go through the pleadings and point out. And most of the times, to your horror, you find that that's been missing. That's why at the beginning I said, what is obvious is apt to be missed. We feel it's so natural. Let me tell one simple instance from another wonderful book, A Liar Can Read, though it appears on the face of it unconnected. That is Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande. A good book. You know, in that one he narrates, is a doctor by profession, a surgeon. He narrates, in America till recently, every year, 100,000 patients were dying because of post-operational complications. And those post-operational complications arose because of one small oversight or error by the surgeon. That is, not washing his hands before he's performing the operation. So, this Atul Gawande prepared a checklist for all the doctors. He was then the presidential advisor for Bill Clinton. So he circulated that checklist to all hospitals. And in fact, the mortality rate has come down crashing. So my friends, please believe me. Our memory is not infallible. So it's quite essential that we better adopt certain methods and that book which I've read gives you wonderful inputs into that one. You can prepare a checklist for drafting, you can prepare a checklist for trial, you can prepare a checklist for cross-examination. Actually, it was the brainchild of the pilots. I was told, subject to correction, as mentioned in that book, before takeoff, a pilot should have 250 tests run in the cockpit. And initially, most of the times, they missed on one or two and they proved fatal. That's why they practiced. So in trial two, the consequences could be fatal. Why not? We practice that method. Please think over. Having said about the pleadings, I only underline one aspect, especially when you're practicing in the trial court. Please remember, at the very beginning, you may send a notice on your client's behalf. And then that leads to litigation. And it may go all the way up to the Supreme Court. But the whole fulcrum of the case is your notice. So that is the importance of pleadings. We have to be really wary about that one. We can't afford to be taken. Having said that one, I would like to say it's only the bird's eye view, a thumbnail sketch, nothing else detailed. In the court of question and answer session, I would like to focus more on any aspects you would like to, you want me to dwell on. For that, now I'll move on to the trial aspects. Because I was talking about the perspective of a trial court, when you are in high court or in Supreme Court, if at all my vanity permits me to assume that there are many from that and listening to me still. You may not have the felt need of uh, knowing the nuances or the integrity of trial. But briefly though, let me tell you, for the benefit of the ones that have been practicing in trial court, about this aspect as well. You know, the chief examination has now been practically dead, thanks to amendment in CPC and other areas. Now it is being largely through affidavits. So we need not dwell much on that aspect. But when it comes to cross-examination, you know, it's a very fascinating one. It's a mind game rather. And let me tell you, what is the leading question? So that, that paves the way for us to have a further discussion in a short while and then move on. Let's assume that I'm questioning. 
a witness. I'll say that you are now 20 years, 27 years old. He says, yes. You were born in Delhi. He says, yes. You studied in Jawaharlal Nehru University. He says, yes. In fact, section 141 defines of evidence act. What a leading question is. Now, let me put it on the converse. How old are you? 27. Where were you born? Delhi. Where did you study? JNU. This is the proper question. The first one is leading question. Then, when it comes to the role you play as an advocate in the trial, I may quote Keith Evans in his book, Common Sense Rules of Advocacy. That's a good book. It can be read through in a matter of a couple of hours. Then advocates will get immensely benefited. They can as well go through. He says, you are a licensed professional. The court of law is a theater. Your job is to make it a professional theater. And as I've told you, to be brief, I've skipped the chief examination part. Now I briefly focus on the cross-examination. To begin with, cross-examination is not a ritual to be gone through in every case. Unless it's essential, don't ever go for it. And if you go for it, do that to the extent required, not beyond. I'll give you, I'll give you one illustration. Let's assume you're handling a case in rent control regime. And there is a provision of exempting a building from rent control purview for 10 years after its construction. A tenant comes to the court before a rent control court seeking protection from eviction. You, as the defendant's counsel, the landlord's counsel, take a plea that this building has been protected. It doesn't attract the provisions. That's why the court, the tribunal does not have jurisdiction, whatever defense you take. And your turn comes to cross-examine the tenant. Let's say, for example, in 2020, May, your first question is to the tenant, I visualize, you are the first tenant in the building, as you call with the cliche tip, you demise premises building. He says, yes, let's assume it was new. Then the next question is, you joined in 2012? Yes. So you have seen three things there. One is, the building was new and the plaintiff was the first defendant, first tenant, and he joined in 2012. That means well within 20, 10 years. We can as well in arguments develop that aspect and we can as well stop the cross-examination at that. The problem is the more we cross-examine, the more opportunities we give to the witness to escape, to find a way out trial. For that purpose, the experts advise, whenever you're cross-examining, think out in advance the answer you want to hear. And design your question with a view to getting that answer. To put it otherwise, know what you want from the witness before you ever question him. And always lay foundation before you question the pivotal one. And always give leading questions in cross-examination. Never ever a direct question. That's your privilege as a cross-examiner. Only leading questions. You can see the magic happen. Let me tell you one example which I faced when I was practicing. That is a matrimony, rather a maintenance case under section 125 of CRPC. And uh, my client was a daily wager, a mansion by trade, and his wife filed the MC, maintenance case as we call it, in our jurisdiction. 125 CRPC. Then my client told me, Sir, 
we both are from lower middle class families. But my wife is relatively rich, definitely richer than me. And I go far and across the places, work as a mason, get money. But my wife insists, let's go to my parents because there were only two daughters for the parents. So already my sister and brother-in-law, they are there. We too can be there. With the land they have, with the assets they have, they could as well feed us well. You need not go far off leaving me this way. And uh, this man inquired with his brother, co-brother as we call, and he said, don't ever come <laughs> because you will have torture, whatever, that's the essay. So I started cross-examining the witness, the lady, not educated though. My friends, at the cost of repetition, let me tell you, it's advocacy, matter of stories, inevitably I'm pushed into it. If you have anything boring, please let me know. I'll proceed with that. Then I started questioning her. I said, you remember as a matter of psychology, especially in rural backdrop, a woman always prides the parental origins, talks in glorious terms about the origin of parents and their position in the society. So I caught hold of that one. I said, it's an arranged marriage. She said, yes. And you have had wonderful alliances coming to you, but somehow this was fixed. And you know, every mix, mix, missed opportunity, we feel glorious. So was the case with that lady. And she felt, yes, so. Yes, I had wonderful opportunities, but somehow I got stuck with this man. Then I said, socially, in every way, your family is far superior to this man's family. Yes, sir. She jumped to an answer, said, yes, sir. They can't be compared with me. How sad it is that such family, we are, we have fallen for them. Now you see my plight. He refuses to provide me minima. Then I told her, your parents are well enough to support you. Yes, sir. If you go there, they'll be looking after like you're a queen. Yes, sir, that's what I've been telling him. He's papa, he's, he's a papa, without anything at all to support me. Now, if he comes to my parents' house, we'll be supporting him. Then I have told the court that this is the position she has agreed that my client is a papa. I'm just an example about the advantage of leading questions. But remember, when it comes to the length of cross-examination, you know, it never matters where you begin when you begin, but it all matters where you should stop. That's very fatal, rather very important. Let me tell you, if you ask a dietitian about how you should lose your weight, they may say that just before you feel you are full, stop with something of hunger remaining in your belly. And I say, when it comes to cross-examination, just stop before you feel that is the final step. Don't ever go far. If I could suggest with a couple of illustrations for the overkill or a flourish that I've finished him off. No such thing. You have to reserve your energies, preserve the points so that you can elucidate and expatiate on them when it comes to the arguments. Let me tell from the real case examples as I've taken from books and advocacy. See, in one case, the accused was involved in a drunken ball, brawl, in a liquor bar. The allegation he faced was he bit off the opponent's nose. An eyewitness was cross-examined. Let me see and visualize how the cross-examination proceeds. You have testified my client bit off the end of the victim's nose. The answer is yes, I have. And this was in the bar of, say, Joy and Joy. Yes. It's a long bar, isn't that? I suppose so. It's 40 feet or more in length. Yes, I believe. And it got very dim light as it being a bar, hasn't it? He says, yes, you were at the entrance, the end of the bar, weren't you? Yes. 
and the fight took place at the other end, didn't it? Yes? Or 30 feet away minimum from you? Yes, I guess so. And the bar was crowded, wasn't it? Yes. 20 or 30 people must have been there between you and uh, the incident. Yes, about that number I may say. And if the council had stopped there, it would have been wonderful. You'd have argued in the case that the witness could not be believed. Less reliable because of dreadful lighting, obscured view, it's blocked, 20, 30 people in between, considerable distance from the event. But please listen to the next question in the cross-examination. So how come you say my client beat the guy's nose off? Friends, you can guess the answer. Let me tell you. He replied, after the fight, the accuser left the bar. And as he walked by me, I saw him spitting out a part of the nose. So what's the lesson? That's called the final fatal question. Never ever go for that one because in our Z that we would like to have the clinching aspect, the O kill may not happen. That's why the most pivotal aspect of this cross examination is never put a question for which you are not sure of the answer and never put what you call an open question where the answer is not fixed. It can be anything and that provides. And finally, I'll give one example and just I'll move on. It's again happened, an English case though. Two burglars were trying to break into a jeweler's store. The beat constable, as we call, was the main witness in that case. In the chief, he said, he had come up to within 10 feet of those guys and watched them, they were, what they were doing before arresting them. So there the defense point was, no, could, no one could have gone that close without those two people, the supposed burglars, could notice. They felt it was untrue and unbelievable. Now kindly, let me reenact the cross-examination and how it turned out, the cross-examination of the police constable. Would you tell the court how tall you are? Let me answer that, six feet. Would you mind telling us your weight? About 90 kg, sir. That night, you were wearing uniform, weren't you? Yes, sir. You wore boots as well? Yes, sir. They are departmental boots. True, sir. What size were they? Size 12, sir. I see. Size 12. The departmental boots will have mental skype studded to the sole. Yes, sir. They had a kind of small horseshoe of metal on each heel. Yes, sir. And you say you approached within 10 feet of this man without their seeming to notice your arrival. Yes, sir. Nobody else was around them? No, sir. Then please kindly notice the road leading to the shop is metal topped. Yes, sir. I mean, he clarifies. You didn't approach or a lawn or a grass no, sir. Now let me say that he has stopped there. Then in the argument, he could have explained that a six-footer in his uniform with shoes of metal spikes and horseshoe studded to prevent that from wear and tear, walking on a metal road at the dead night when everything was quiet, would have alerted those people from a particular distance. They wouldn't have been unaware until he went over there and caught hold of them. 
but please see what happened next the final fatal question as i call it well really constable can you suggest to the court how you could possibly have got so close to the accused as you say you did without being heard a petty question don't you agree because is given a rope a blanket question and the answer could you imagine as it happened sir i rode on my bicycle friends when it comes to cross examination you may not be cross examining as you have expected and everything may not be going the way you want it sometimes you find the client a hard nut the witness rather and difficult for you to get anything favorable from him but never ever express your dismay or disappointment the moment you show your frustration then you have lost the client or the witness that's very very important finally let me tell the power of reexamination which is being totally and thoroughly neglected and ignored in trial courts for paucity of time will not be elaborating on it but i tell you that if you read the case law under sections 137 and 138 of penal evidence act you may have in a clues now let me come to the final part that of the arguments as many of us feel the glorious part and please remember advocacy as i have been repeated detailing is the art of storytelling and the story always begins long long ago there lived a king so should be our cases there should be a beginning there should be a middle there should be an end don't ever jump into the middle of the case this is called psychologically speaking the curse of knowledge i'll tell you how most of the times to my surprise more than i've ever expected even the very seasoned advocates begin in the middle because as i've said the curse of knowledge i'll illustrate the client came many years ago to you gave the brief explained to you you drafted and you conduct the trial and finally you are arguing the case by then you have internalized the whole case as if it were part of your body and the curse of knowledge says we always believe whatever we know even others also know so you feel the judge too knows whatever you know until then so straight away you go to what you feel as your strong point and say that this is the one the judge may not have read the entire brief and he is something like a tourist you are the tourist guide you have to lead him by hand you have to tell him about every aspect beginning at the beginning that's why please ensure that you don't ever begin in the middle begin as if it were a story with an element of curiosity at the very beginning this i believe a very vital aspect in a sense you may have a presumption as we say your lordship knows yes there is a sense of presumption when it comes to the law not the facts you and your client are the masters of the facts so you need to enlighten the court from the beginning briefly though about the argumental aspect vital beginnings of the case how well you begin determines how wonderfully you are going to proceed and then end it but my friends keep it simple if possible avoid details which are not essential if you ask any writer he will tell this concept as chekhov's gun you know the russian writer anton chekhov once he said if at all you talked about in your story a gun kept on the table in the first part of the story by the time you finish it it must be firing at some stage otherwise there's no need to mention about that i'll give you an illustrious example you are handling in the court of law high court let me say as an example a case about retirement benefits which have been denied to a particular employee you wanted to plead you wanted to argue 
And you can see in most of the cases, either in the pleadings or in the arguments, we start at the very beginning in the sense that there was a notification in 1975 and so many people contested, rather applied for that one. And uh, this petitioner was selected. He joined as so-and-so, got promoted and so-and-so, then went on to so-and-so. And once he was suspended, then reinstated, all things will narrate the whole story. And we say that finally retired. When he retired, he was denied one particular increment and the consequential benefit in the retirement. This is the story. Unless somebody retired, means unless somebody joined. There's no question of he's retiring and getting the terminal benefits. So is it really essential to go into the chronology logical explanation of the whole career of that man? That's what I meant. Chekhov's gun, you please remember, either arguing or writing, that it must be one scene, it must be firing. So if you mention a date, it should have its impact somewhere. If you mention a fact, it should have its impact somewhere. Otherwise, we'd better not clutter the court with the facts which may be quite easy for you because you've been watching from the beginning, but not the judge. We have been focusing, as I say, exposed. You can as well check in my last lecture, I explained what's exposed approach of the court and the ex ante approach. I don't want to repeat that one. We focus exposed on the case, on the case, but the judge focuses ex ante. It's one among the many cases he must be handling, the briefer, the sweeter for him. And with the focus, it's something like, a ray of light, if it's diffused, it burns nothing. If it's focused, you know what results. That should be the argument. It should be a focused beam of light, cutting the toughest metal of the opponent's case. If I could add a bit of poetry to that one. Now, let me tell you the manner of arguing. Friends, you may see people like automatons or machines. Only their lips move. No other part of the body moves. A lifeless machine, perhaps, reeling out the facts. I don't think it could be uh, interesting for anybody. You have seen the orators, how they gesticulate when they speak. And our body speaks more than our words. You know pretty well that. And to say that, man is, rather, a human being is more video than audio. To tell that one, Trial is audio and argument is video. One psychoanalyst tells 60% of a message is conveyed by body language and visual appearance. 30% of message is conveyed by tone of the voice. I have taken it from Keith Ivan's book. Only 10% of a message comes through the words used. And of that, 10% is remembered from what has been heard. And if at all, if the listener, say the judge in this case, can relate whatever has been spoken to a particular thing, which is graphic, spatial, then he remembers 50% of what he has heard. That's why one has to be Really articulate, my friends. And with your permission, if I could see some of the participants on the screen, I would like to have one small psychological experiment, which if you are willing, participate with me and see the power of body in communicating to the court, in convincing the court. It's not the words we speak that matter, really speaking. It is the way we present the Message is in the medium. The way you present it matters more than the message. That's what the saying says. Vikas, can I have this experiment for two minutes? Sir, we are already, but majority of the participants have invariably seen that they stopped their video. I would ask the participants, they can start the video so that we can have an active participation. Or else I can move on. It's up to you. No, uh, it's fine. I can just check out, out of the 250 participants how many. We have got a good audience. We can experiment on that also. Right then? Yeah. I can see a couple of you. Please kindly uh, help me with this experiment if you want to, because it drives home a very vital point for advocacy. For that, I've been doing it. Will you touch your chin, please? And just follow my instructions carefully. 
touch your chin touch your lips touch your nose touch your cheeks touch your eyes touch your eyebrows please follow me touch your forehead my friend i said for it but i showed my head most of us must have put it here rather than here because it illustrates the listener follows the body rather than the word that's what i wanted to i believe i have driven my point across if you want to have some fun you can as well do that with your friends but one need to have a bit of tact in that one but anyway i'd like to underline that we are performers lawyers are performers they are born actors they are like actors or models or whatever you call they are essentially visual this we have to remember speak with your body as much as you can and let me tell you the first impression is the best impression present yourself proudly to the court in the best attire possible day in and day out and you know what's meant by best attire i only say if you read hamlet's brother shakespeare's hamlet there polonius the minister advises his son they are tears what how a man should be you know that quotation neither a borrower nor a lender be in that he says you should buy clothes as much as your pocket permits or as costly as is your pocket permits he says the apparel of proclaim the man and while arguing i have seen many people not only that many of you may have observed if you close your eyes you don't know whether he's speaking out or reading out it's so stuffy so formal with all long sentences and ins and they rather here ins there ins that to there of and all those things when we talk when we communicate when we argue let's try to be as normal as possible sans or without any what you call uh, legalese or the jargon we can call it for example don't ever say the plaintiff was driving a motor vehicle instead we can say if at all it's a car the plaintiff is driving a car no need to say the parties have entered into an agreement or a contract we can say that they have contracted they have struck a deal don't say the witness testified simply say the witness told and i know pretty well it's very easy to tell because some judges may not like if i tell say that the parties have struck a deal and you are the best judge to see whether somebody has been accommodative or somebody goes by the strict rule book whatever and i was told most seasoned lawyers whenever they face a new judge whatever be the rank of the judge it doesn't matter after all he gives the order which we have been looking forward to and uh, they come well in advance observe the style of the functioning of the judge his body language his outlook approach and everything and then they must be thinking of which way we could present so it changes person to person it's highly as i said at the beginning individualistic my friends as i was telling the attention span has been coming down so if we indulge in indulge in long arguments or repeat with long sentences it goes down the drain with shortest possible sentences we'd better tell them in the plainest long language possible if you want to know the way the brain plays the mind plays as i was talking about this neuroplasticity in our advocacy may i recommend a couple of books by daniel amen if you want to read one is magnificent mind at any age and another one is making a good brain great and still if you are more interested you can read his book use your brain to change your age they are good read and it gives you a clear perspective about how one should conduct oneself and the the, the tricks that our mind plays in what way we tend to be 
And finally, let me tell you, before we could sign off and have the question and answer sessions, be a likable person. Most of the times, we may try to, without causing offense, let me tell you, we may try to play to the galleries. Mostly when there is a client, we feel that our first duty is to impress him, but I'm afraid that may not be the one. When you are likable, when you approach, when you adopt a very soft approach, the court always leans in your favor, at least psychologically speaking. And let me finally tell one psychological experiment that's been conducted about the human attitude. Once a baby monkey was orphaned and it had to be reared, the psychologists have done one thing. They have made two dummy monkeys. One is capable of milking, the other one no milk. But the one that could milk, secrete milk, was very harsh, hard metal, uncomfortable to touch, whatever. The one that could not milk was fluffy, soft, like a natural one, etc. When this hungry baby monkey was left, first it went to the one that had the milk, but did not stay long, it rushed and went to the one that doesn't, but still very soft. And it stuck to it despite its hunger. What does it indicate? It shows that our attitude really matters. And indeed our attitude either wins the cases or loses the cases. And let me underline one thing. You know the concept of his master's voice, HMV gramophones. And we should never be HCVs, that is his client's voice. And always believe that you are assisting the court, you are guiding the court. When, as I said, if the court is the tourist, you are the tourist guide that's been leading by the gentle hand. When court believes that your primary aim is to help the court to arrive at correct things, it readily believes you. It gets rid of all notions of any apprehensions which it usually will have. So my friends, and as you believe in Newton's rules of motion, for every action that is equal and opposite reaction, if we are aggressive, the same thing we may expect from the bar, and we, we are very persuasive, so must be the attitude on the other side. The more you pull, the more the resistance. The more you sail, and sail along, the speedier you reach your goal. That should be the attitude, I believe. Though I may have a couple of aspects, I believe that I've already gone into more than one hour. And may I say, if at all, the questions are there, they will open up the areas where I would like to focus more. That's how I've uh, told Mr. Chatter initially also, I couldn't visualize which area I should cover because it's very amorphous. Uh, it's uh, formless. Whatever I feel may not be necessarily important for you and vice versa. So please come out with your questions. The areas which we feel should be enlightened more, we can as well discuss. And uh, he's highly subjective. And what I say may not be right, but after all, it is my experience and my exposure. It may appeal to you, may not appeal to you, but still, if there's a point, there is some consideration. And once again, let me tell you, don't ever believe that this is an impossible task and profession is meant for only few. No, you're absolutely unique young man, if at all anybody's listening, with not much experience. In American schools, they teach a method called, I am somebody, not somebody, one among the millions faceless, I am somebody. That means, our thumb is unique, and we are as unique as our thumb. So is this profession, so are you. You are unique. You've got the best of the things at your disposal. Never ever accept to be the second best. Why not? You think of, as Vivekananda said, yes, Krishna is great, Rama is great, Jesus is great, Buddha is great. So what is it to me? I must be great. You may have seen really great people across, but there isn't anything that differentiates you from them. You too can be as great as they are. Be a performer and never stop. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. It was a wonderful session and it opened new vistas of the mind because the topic when we had the team of Beyond Law CLC had contacted you, uh, you're well aware that we had a lot of brainstorming as to whether 
advocacy tools and skills will be a topic which could be well received amongst the students professionals and the teachers because invariably what a whatever experience we had with the within the team and what we exchanged we all found that invariably every lawyer feels or a student for that matter when he attempts a paper he feels that he had shown the things in the right perspective but the teacher had not given him the good marks or he had argued in a good way or he had drafted in a good way but the judge somehow didn't accept his line of thought process and consequently he could not Uh, get the best of the results as they say that the potter would never say that his pot was weak or it is broken he will always believe a painter would always say that his painting is good people are not ready to con- conceive the manner in which it has been done and rather every invariably the professional feels that he is being paid less than what proportionate efforts he is putting in rarely in life you will always find that a person says that i am doing less efforts but god has been kind enough and i am getting more rarest of rare is the occasion like we use this maxim rarest of rares same is the case with the lawyer student everybody nobody feels that he is getting more than what he is actually due we will just request everyone that the question should be short because otherwise we will be running short of time but be that as it may we were all captivated the way you took us to the examples on different points and the way you also conducted a life uh, mock demo as to how things could what could be the reaction that was an interesting facet uh we will take the questions and interestingly uh, we since we are also live on the facebook i would request all the participants that they should try to register early because today what what we had experienced it that in the waiting room we had more than 60 70 persons and one go and sometimes one who was not been able to enter he started making his entry with three or four uh time and again with that what happened is that in the waiting room neither he could participate neither he didn't allow the participation so i would also say that even participating in the webinar is also an art that you have to log in early and so that you can also participate in the webinar so i would share that i had read a book that successful people don't do different things they do it differently and in that case mr shiv khara says that whatever is the timeline let's assume you have to go to the office at 10 o'clock invariably everybody will like to check in at 10 only but if he says that you make it 5 minutes earlier than the time schedule that you would always reach early the traffic would not be a congested one once i had gone to dubai same was the incident my friend said that even in mumbai you you were there you know that this happens so we are taking the questions and the fact the session has been well received we had a stable participants and the uh, people were quite patient uh, mr anurag jain please throw some lights on suggesting to be given during the cross examination under what provisions of law suggestions are given and uh, what is your take on that well uh, it is a question that needs uh, quite some explanation at some length but i would like to put it straight and narrow for that purpose let me tell you it's something like once uh, vincent van gogh wanted to paint the rising sun every day he would go out stand facing the east before sun could rise we would watch the sun until late into the day then come back and try to paint the next day the next day like the next day ultimately he became blind because every day he exposed with his neck the eye to the sun and his brother was exasperated he asked him are you mad why do you do this one every day you have seen the sun once that is enough you need not see every day to paint and when vincent van gogh replied rather unfortunately i can't help it because every day i see a different sun so in the case that comes to cross examination and it changes from case to case from person to person and even from day to day so they can't be set principles but as we know when you are driving a car you have got certain parameters to be followed 
and even when you change the make of the car to a different one, still you can as well have it. You need not every time learn driving a new model of a car. So is the case with this one. I advise read a couple of standard books on the auto cross examination that provides you the theoretical aspect. Then keenly observe the seniors doing it because as I've said, the more exposure you have, subconsciously you will, as I said, the memory muscle will have its own way of thinking and formulating the skills without your knowing ever. That's why experience cannot be replaced by any strategy or stratagem. So first thing you get the inputs which are from the life of the people who have conducted the trials from various books and then have a keen eye to the detail when you have been examining rather when some senior counsel has been doing it and eventually when you do it every time you just observe yourself keenly by adopting this method where you have been successful today if you haven't felt satisfied about the approach you have had you are be like, rather willing to change and go ahead keep experimenting and never be afraid of experimenting. Come out of the comfort zone. Then only you can explore the new vistas. This is the only thing I can tell about. Because there can't be any set principles of uh, uh, principles that can be told you straight away offhand and that can lead you all through. It isn't possible. Thank you. Uh, Mukesh Tanwar, what is the key to develop good drafting? As we see, there is a pre-decided pattern running for a particular type of a plaint or a petition. Yes. Is it fine to draft in its own pattern and style and present in the court, or there is something we have to build on ourselves? Yes. See, essentially, our drafting is a matter of limitation. It's a peer pressure. We see somebody else, we follow the same way. We never stop and think whether it is right, whether it's essential or necessary. But now, believe me, England and America are the native speakers of English and they've got their laws and they've appointed the linguistic committees to revise all their laws into plain English and they have been insisting in every court to use only plain language in the draftings not archaic style and uh, if you want to see the judgment of say for example Justice Elena Kagan of American Supreme Court when you read her ladyship judgment, it's like she was talking to you across the page. So is the case with the drafting of these things. You see the schedules annexed to CPC. Whatever be the case, it doesn't cross more than one page. But still, in our eagerness, despite Article 6 of CPC, we go into pages into pages, try to impress. If at all, you need to know the style of writing. Please, as I've suggested, that book by Rather Hughes. Ross Huberman, point made. And that gives you the examples of all uh, very famous lawyers across the world, how they have used the language to persuade in the briefs. That's one good book. There are many other books, but the book that I've read and felt impressed is one of them. That's why, uh, my friend, uh, you better have a book like that one and see how the modern approach could help you in clarifying things and making things straight away apparent to the judge as well. Yes, please. Uh, Mr. Naidu, I just wanted, like, uh, the, you have given so many books as one, what one has to do as an art of advocacy. One question which was boggling within my mind was, as to whether you have read these books when you were an advocate or you're still reading while you are a judge. Should I confess? Last time, I, last time I told you that I am incapable of doing anything else except reading. My inability has come to my advantage. And I have read them honestly. And I always believe, give me, give me a good book on how to make a racket, I'll make one. No, they yes. always say that the books are the best friends. <laughs> and, both read, and the most fascinating part of the books is that they don't criticize you, they will always improve you. Indeed. Thank yeah. you, well said. Because it's a one-sided affair that you will always be, you will always enhance your skills, your muscle skills, as what you said, taking cue from you. And once I was discussing when I was a slightly young lawyer, because lawyers are only young and very young. So when I was very young, at that point of time, I was discussing with somebody, he said, just keep on reading, you never know in which part of your brain that particular part will be stored. Yes. And yeah, we had Mr. Lakshmi Kumaran from LNS, 
he said that on on an average besides what you are reading you should also read around 8 to 10 judgments in a day so that you enhance your skills of reading and gradually i have also seen that once you start reading the vocabulary automatically enhances and you also start incorporating within your uh, drafting as well as while you are arguing during the court hours also one does so now we have please throw some light on suggestions to be given during cross examination under what provisions of law uh, and suggestions are to be given uh, because i believe i have already answered that question the same question now it's come back in a different form i said there's no set formula you read standard books follow the experienced persons and devise your own method which suits you well that's what i've said and i've elaborated on that one yes we have advocate ravi indar he is from uh, our high court so i know him he, he says how to prepare the client for cross examination what are all things are to be kept in mind what all should be told to the client should we tutor the client on both sides his and the other side what is your take on that yes though i am no authority on how really the client should be prepared for that one but i have seen one instance in my native town tirupati there used to be one counsel who is no more a senior counsel one mr subarao and i was told he was he was a very famous criminal lawyer i was told a couple of days or even one day before the cross examination or the examination per se of his client he in his office has recreated the court room sort of a, a demo one and uh, he puts the client in the dock he goes through the whole process with the help of his juniors etc so that the client gets acclimatized and also he knows the method and manner and the aggressive approach everything it's smart though but still a sort of a real life example that's how he has done it it's it appears perhaps far fetched but certainly why not we give a try more so the problem is now chief examinations have been dispensed with now they are in the form of affidavits and usually affidavits reflect whatever has been pleaded many many years ago the client may not have been aware what's been pleaded there once he goes into the witness box straight away for cross examination as the atmosphere is daunting that unnerves him and also he may not be well versed in facing the opponent counsel etc so perhaps one such method it's anybody's idea and imagination we can keep on experimenting but that's what i have seen as a sort of an example which has yielded results perhaps we may think of one such thing i don't think i have a ready formula for that one yes so before i uh, i am taking one question one we have vishal bagde he is a student so i will unmute him so that his question is also taken uh, the question is between advocacy and judiciary this is not i'm sorry uh, hello no sir i am just checking out because some people are invariably praising it i have to told you can understand that once you are on the platform uh, yes vishal you can uh, ask the question directly vishal hello, hello? he is vishal bhag from vishal please speak on yes sir yes vishal vishal hello sir am i audible yes it's audible you can go ahead vishal so we will read the next question uh, till vishal gets back vishal is it audible you can uh, put the question hello sir, sir? yes vishal go ahead the advocate mohammed once i was arguing uh, no uh, this is from yella yella minchili shiva santosh what is the importance of chronology of the drafting according to you the counsel uh, the young advocate who asked that question is my good friend <laughs> anyway what is that question so uh, what is the importance of chronology of events in drafting how do you want to how should one go about drafting well very well said we all believe that mind always thinks linear 
Uh, Vishal, we are muting you because you are not able to put the question. Yes. I can read your question. Meanwhile. Yes, sir. Can I go ahead? Yes, sir. Yes. We all believe that uh, our mind thinks linear in a vertical manner, in a chronological manner. Later, people like Tony Bhushan, who has invented mind maps, has come onto the scene. They have said that it thinks in circles. That's why his method has become very popular. Then taking a few from that one, even Brian A. Garner has devised a method called for arguments, for drafting, etc. The Wiley Bird method. If anybody cares to read Brian A. Garner's book called The Plain Language for Lawyers, the plain English for lawyers. That book gives the methods how to draft, in what manner you have to collate the facts, how you should set them, and then which way, which is important, which is unimportant, which way that cadence can be created in draftings. I think one has to have a couple of good books on that aspect to learn the principles. And it's true, to begin with, we'd better have a chronology so that we'll have, as I said, the beginning, the middle, and the end. And once we have that bird's eye view, a 360 degrees view, then we can pick and choose whatever is necessary to be pleaded. So it is good, one should begin with, to prepare things in chronological manner, but while drafting, it's highly personal view. While drafting, either you can stick to a method which is absolutely chronological, or faithfully beginning at one stage, then shifting on based on the importance of the points you would like to stress. It's a matter of an individual choice. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Tulasiram, what is one thing one should keep in mind when you are facing a very senior or reputed counsel so that you are uh, not bowed down by the objection? I mean, I was, it really happens. I was looking for this question, in fact. And let me answer. My friends, you must have heard about one advocate called Jerry Spence. He's an American trial lawyer. And in the last 40 years, please believe me, in the last 40 years, he hasn't lost even a single case. And he's the busiest lawyer. He has defended across the world who is who, all state heads and etc. And in cases where, and say for example, a murder event was videographed, CC camera Scott, still he could get his client out, legendary sort of a person. He wrote a book called How to Argue and Win Every Time. The book's name is How to Argue and Win Every Time. In that book, he cites an example. That is, he says, never get overawed by the reputation of the opponent counsel. And he says, the reputation or the respect he commands is what you give to him rather than what he has inherently. For that purpose, he cites an example. Suppose you go to a, a new place, say a city, you check into a hotel and uh, next day in the morning in the nearby park, you go for a morning walk. You pass by a person, you don't pay any attention, you come, you go back to your room. Next day it happens. Third day, you are walking and incidentally you see a local person who is your friend. You met him there. You both were walking. The same person whom you just bypassed and went by without noticing last two days was going. The other man says, he is the man who committed 10 murders and now he's been on bail. Then the next day, your attitude will be totally different towards him. So first two days, if at all he was inherently dangerous or something like that, you would have been naturally knowing about it. He says as an example, though sort of an outlier example, the reputation is what you confer on the council. So kindly refuse to acknowledge the greatness of your opponent. In your hearts, you may respect the advocacy skills, but when it comes to an opponent, he is just an opponent. Treat him like that. That's what he says in that one. It's been beautifully explained in that one for ad young advocates say. You can read that one. How to argue and win every time. Uh, Ashok Kumar Bunga. While drafting, should we quote the famous quotes from classics and some uh, famous authors or simply we should go over the drafting and while time at the time of arguments, we should See, know that. Originally, originally, advocacy is the art of rhetoric. And rhetoric, technically speaking, nothing but persuasion. Later, we have had many figures of speech adding to that one so that we'll have uh, all sorts of hyperbole, tropes and other things, irony. But I believe drafting may not be the area where 
we should display our literary skills about quotations and other things. We better not, unless it is really compelling. <laughs> Uh, Vishal Bagde, since we couldn't uh, mute, uh, mute him, he, uh, he couldn't be heard, he has sent a text. What books a law student must read to have better understanding of law, advocacy, body language, etc.? Ah, wonderful. Recently, I was reading a good book, The Articulate Lawyer. It's available on Amazon. It's a very good book on how to stand, how to... Uh, how to express yourself in a stylish manner, the body language, the whole uh, with pictures and diagrams it explains. It can be a fascinating read for any young advocate how to uh, carry himself in the court of law. And uh, all that you have to do is go to Google, just type one sentence calling the best books on out of advocacy, the best books on say cross examination. It will give the whole list of books. You choose whatever you like in that one. It may not be humanly possible for me to belt out all those books and whatever I have read, I've already spoken about them. Still, if you want, I can supply a list and post it. That invariably large number of participants have posted. That, I will do that. Yes, because invariably in during sessions, we get one or two suggestions. But today we had a barrage of uh, books coming forth. It was just like facing Vakar Yunus and the other side is not Tandulkar. <laughs> I will do that for the benefit of young lawyers. Uh, uh, Vishal Bhagre is asked, uh, as a student of law, uh, which advocacy school should I develop first? Or there, should it be developed in a pattern? Or it should, uh, with the rent of time, it will improve? No, please, please repeat. I couldn't. There was some so in the uh, Which advocacy skill should one develop in a college, being a law student? Yes. Should we focus on one particular skill and then go to the second step or let all these uh, skills we try to inculcate in one flow? The college status is embryonic. It's the seed. And the seed incorporates, as you know, how tiny the seed of bunion tree and how big it expands when it's, the sapling comes out. So is the case with the life of an advocate, rather a student. You are the seed with the immense potential like a bunion tree. And whatever the skills that have been possible, you try to master them because the time is at your disposal. Once you become a practitioner, that's one of the luxuries you can ill afford, the time. That's why perhaps invariably and invaluable is the question of drafting skill. And then comes the third aspect, the auditorial skills. In between is the trial aspect, which I don't think is possible for a student unless he has practical exposure. So. Let me say that besides reading the law books, an advocate should rather a student should read biographies and autobiographies of famous lawyers. So uh, it's a sort of a passive learning or vicarious learning from the experience of those stalwarts that will make them in good stead. And if possible, even from the student stage, I believe if, an, if a young man, rather a student, could read one law journal from cover to cover, whatever the principles he's been learning, they are put in the context in those judgments and that goes a long way in shaping his view about the law and how he could excel in it. Uh, Rajat Malhotra has actually asked a question which will help many people. He says, when the stakes are high, how to control the anxiety before and at the time of arguments, which otherwise often produces non-desirable results? Yes, very good question. You know, I just briefly touched on that saying that never ever be the HCV, his client's voice. And the moment we are uh, hatchet men, that means simply doing the job of our client, we lose the confidence of the court. Certainly, you have been cast with the obligation of defending your client or presenting your client's case in the most possible light possible. At the same time, you should also ensure that being the confidence of the court, underline the fact that you have been there to guide, rather to assist the court, to help it, and then lead along. Lead along. You say, for example, if you say that, I have explained that, court may still have a doubt. Instead, uh, I believe, my lord, this is a concept which I find it difficult to explain. Court will say, no, 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 you have explained well enough. Come on. They, they tend to encourage. So that way, know the psychology of the court and accept any shortcoming on your part before court finds out. And court feels, yes, 
he's my protege. I should come to his rescue. And they become paternal in their attitude, protective in their approach. Yes, please. Uh, sir, uh, this is Dr. Tushara James. Yes, please. Uh, she has appeared before you, she says. Uh, she says, does art of advocacy vary from a male to female? Because he says that, let's assume a lawyer who is an, a male who is an assertive, he's appreciated. Whereas if female is assertive, he's invariably considered to be arrogant. What is your take since you are the, on the other side? See, when you read the life story of Padi Shankara, once he had to have uh, an argument in scholarly uh, fields with uh, Mandana Mishra. So, if you want to be a scholar, you should have proficiency in all 64 arts. But about one art he being a celibate, about Sringara Rasa, he did not have. Then the story goes, such of a fable, that he transmigrated into a soul and then he got the experience and he uh, argued and uh, defeated the opponent. But now I cannot do that one, I'm a man. I can, I've had my understanding about how I have faced the problems, how others can. When it comes to gender specific, I am ill-equipped to answer that one, but I accept with a sense, common sense, yes, they stand in a different footing and they do face more than what we face. And we have maybe our stereotypes, our mental blocks coming to that one. Slowly, the profession may be opening up, but still, yes, they do have certain peculiar problems. I wish they would be going away soon. So, but we have also experienced like large number of female Advocates who are doing well, now designation of seniors is also uh, much larger in percentage and judges yes. have also been started being appointed. Yes. But I can take, uh, my take is that if a female judge is arguing in a better perspective, she's immediately noticed and the advocacy part also goes that uh, she's arguing well. She's acknowledged also on that aspect that despite his odds that she's working in a woman as a uh, uh, working as a housewife, working uh, working as a professional, she's maintaining the balance between them and still she's performing better. So that factor helps to put the point forward. And mm -hmm. once you're doing well, you are always appreciated. Yes. So he say, uh, uh, one question is, uh, what is your take? Uh, should we refer judgments in a bail application or not? Better not. Present them before the learned judge. Why cite them in the in the pleadings itself. It's been the practice in many courts, but I don't see any particular advantage for that one. Keep that brief. The briefer, the shorter your brief is, the more readily the judge reads it thoroughly. The longer it is, he is put off, obviously. So keep it short. And then when you argue, he's been familiar by then because you have presented him in a nutshell. He has come up after going through that one. Then to persuade you to cite them, instead of make it long, Citing and putting off the learned judge. Uh, Rona Cardia uh, has posted a question on the Facebook. Recommended career path for a new lawyer: private practice or a job at a law firm? Hello. Uh, what, can I answer that question? Which way? Left to myself, I love advocacy. The thrill of standing on feet and delivering. Nothing replaces it. If you causally sit in the chair and you would like to draw your salary and then be happy giving opinions, it's perhaps your cup of coffee, not mine. That's what I feel. Uh, uh, Sapanthir, if you reserve your case in draftings, then the judge would say you have not mentioned in the pleadings and how you are arguing. What is your take on it, sir? Could you repeat that? I don't get so it. He says, let's assume we do not refer to any judgment, etc. Then sometimes some people say that you have not pleaded that particular aspect in your pleadings. So how to come out of that situation? See, we are supposed to plead the facts, not the law. And precedence is a matter of law. And facts pleaded, if there is any observation in the judgment by the learned judge that you have not pleaded, the record shows that. And uh, if at all it's a matter of question, question of law, if at all court says that that's not been argued, it's always open for the at the appellate stage, pure question of law to be argued or get it remanded if the court is convinced on that aspect, if nothing rather much turns on it. So I just found it difficult to understand because we are concerned with the facts when it comes to the pleadings, not the law. 
Why are we mixing that law into that one? Yes. So, uh, Devika Raj, she's a lawyer in Punjab and High Court. She says, with virtual courts becoming the need of the day, importance of written pleading seems to be uh, override the impact of oral pleadings or arguments. Please share your some tips how to draft concise, precise pleadings so that we can hit uh, bullseye. Yeah, part of the question I've already answered. I've said books like uh, uh, Point Made will uh, teach you how to draft. Then I have told about uh, Brian A. Garner's couple of books, Winning Brief, and then Plain English for Lawyers. They've all given all these techniques. And uh, the virtue of any brief, any argument is brevity. We know that one. Courts have been flooded with cases. Judges have been under tremendous pressure, if I can speak on that aspect. And uh, anybody has the art of presenting in a nutshell, and I think they are going to be the preferred uh, choices of any judge having an eye on the time. Mukesh Tanwar, uh, how does it affect that face value, social status, once you have to, once you enter into the profession because these big cars, big show of business, sometimes it's a showbiz. Do you believe that that does help or one should remain more focused on the professional aspects? I believe we should focus more on the professional skills. I'll tell why. Suppose an engineer, he passes out, then he takes up his profession and nobody's going to question him whether he's right or wrong. So is the case of the doctor. He treats us. If we don't get cured, again, we go back to him. Trial and error, he changes the medicine. But a lawyer's position, he has to perform on his feet in the public glare. And the moment he makes a mistake, the other side counsel will be pouncing on him. So it's a daily battle for him. So having a big car and a bungalow will not come to his rescue when it comes to performing and delivery. At the end of the day, your client only comes to you provided you can deliver. And he hardly, it hardly matters for him whether you have a fine bungalow or a very fine car. Uh, that I also seen that people sometimes in big houses do not make the mark, whereas people coming from a humble background uh, do make a mark. I was yes. just reading uh, that you also come from a, a farmer's family and you have not, you in fact have not studied initially in English, but once if we one uh, hear you during all, uh, the second session of ours, it doesn't seem that you had actually studied all your academics in Telugu. How was the transition from Telugu to English? How did you do that? How many hours averagely you believe that the lawyers that sector should study? Is it true that you actually studied in Telugu and all? Indeed, true. And um, uh, it may not be proper to speak about myself. You'd better uh, have some question that will be... No, no. I'm just saying that you studied in Telugu. How is the transition from Telugu to English? Because everybody feels in handicap if one has re uh, studied in a regional language, Hindi or the mother, uh, the Punjabi or whatever language he has done. Sometimes mm. one, he feels that there's a handicap. But I'm saying that once we have seen that you have, uh, you have become proficient in English, what tip do you give to the participants? That how should they should also improve their English. That's yes. my take. You know, I'll do one thing. I will not say what I have done because that touches upon my personal life. But yes. I'll tell what can be done. I'll tell and what can be done. I, I, I say it's in, just like in law what we say, not a judgment in persona, but judgment in rem. <laughs> I'll tell. I made a conscious effort to learn the language. I bought a couple of books on the same vocabulary. I've started studying them, then noting down, gathering every information. So is the case with grammar, so is the case with usage, and all these things. And when it comes to the fluency, the style, and other things, you know, after all, we learn the language imitatively. We imitate. Suppose you are in a particular part of the country, you pick up that accent of Hindi. And if you are in some other place, still it goes. So essentially, it's a matter of imitation. As far as, as I was in the village, I did not have anybody, any fear to imitate or to model myself after. Then I started listening to radio, say BBC. Then, uh, without my knowing, subconsciously and passively, I picked up a bit of uh, flair or fluency from that. So I, I kept on with that one. I believe language learning is a daily process. To this day, 
I just spend 10 minutes per vocabulary, 10 minutes per my usage and all those things. It's a never ending process. So I have just learned the hard way. For example, we are talking about the tools of trade. Vocabulary is very essential for a lawyer to communicate. And uh, how long will it take to have a good repertoire of uh, vocabulary? It takes considerable time because the uh, older you are, the less capable of uh, learning new words. And uh, a child could at least learn 35 to 50 words a month, new words, whereas an adult could learn about four words a month. This is what psychology says, at least. Then there have been wonderful books on uh, the vocabulary. And the simple method, as I say to young lawyers, is root method. For example, 80% of English words are either from Latin or Greek, and they have a root. The root has a meaning. Wherever you see that root, you can see something out of it. Take the example of salt. Salt means jump in Latin. Say insult, you are jumping into a person. Consult, com means together, companion. So consult, salt means jumping. You are jumping together with another person with your ideas. Okay, result, jumping back. Whatever you have done, it's coming back to you. That's result, result. Assault, add plus salt, jump again. You're jumping into somebody with your words or with your actions, you're attacking that man, that's called assault. Then somersault, soma means body in Latin, salt means jump. Somersault means jumping your body by whatever means. So one simple word has given you any number of words. You take spect to look, specs, spectra, spectacle, inspect, conspect, all these things come out of that one. So there are books which are available, say for 100 rupees, 150 rupees, Daily, I've been telling on the last occasion to my favorite thing. If you see a starry night on a clear day and uh, you start counting, how much time will it take to count all the stars visible to a naked eye? People say that it takes a lifetime or impossible, 100 years, 50 years, whatever. And uh, you could check on the Google. One astrologer has said you could with naked eye see only 9,500 stars. Out of that, as we are in one hemisphere, you can see only 4,500. It takes about three years to count all of them. But what appears an impossible task when split into say, minute, minuscule things, it comes to an achievable thing. So any learning process, incremental and daily, you can be a master without you ever knowing it. Uh, so th uh, this is a relevant question, not only for a young lawyer, but also. Uh, Usha asks that sometimes as a young lawyer, one prepares a case in a particular manner. And suddenly the judge asks a question beyond what he has actually prepared. Yes. And how, how to come out of it, how to uh, control that particular situation? Yes. Well, uh, honesty is the best policy. Sometimes you can add a bit of uh, praise uh, to the Lalit judge who put that one. Your lordships have seen that in a perspective which you have never imagined. In fact, honestly, I confess your lordships have taken by surprise on that aspect. It has never stuck to me, it's my mistake. If time is given, I'll get back to your lordships so that that may assist your lordships effort to find the fact about the case. Something like that. Instead of saying, no, that's not important. My case depends on something else. Newton's principles, you please remember, instead of resisting and inviting much more resistance, better sail along and be candid and say that I've not looked at that perspective. When given time, I will. Because we are fallible, we are uh, not what you call omniscient, knowing everything. That isn't humanly possible. Yes. Uh, so we are running short of time. Indeed. But, it's close uh, to two hours. Uh, it's close to two hours, but we never realized that when two hours were over. Just as uh, you were saying that you have to improve vocabulary, I was just reading an article in the morning. It said that let's assume there's a judgment also, or you're drafting again. Then every time you don't have to write the same words, uh, with your permission, I will be just reading. He said, that the way is that how you have to improve your vocabulary. He says, let's assume you have to write admitted, then what are the different options for that? It says you can write admitted, conceded, accepted, maintained, reported, countered that, replied, responded. And then in summarizing the situation, he says, you can't every time say agreed. You can use agreed, submitted, conceded, contended, replied, maintained, suggested, and argued. This, he says that more you read, then more vocabularies for the same word you can always utilize. It. Yes, variety is the spice of life. So one according to you is uh, reading and reading of more of reading. Now one fact which we have always asked and we had also asked you. Invariably the lawyer or anybody who gets 50, 100 pages, 200 pages, 
what is your take whether one should make notes before uh, going for the arguments because at the preliminary hearing the style of argument would be different once the reply has come then the style of argument is different once you are in the lower court then the style of argument is different because you have to appreciate the evidence do you believe that one should prepare the notes so that the pagination is there or do you believe that one should make very concise notes well, how how do you funnel out the entire a, a gamut of 200 pages 400 pages what is your take one should just jot down few points or one should make three four page note yes because we had mr lakshmi kumar on our, on our platform he said just try to make the most concise notes which carry the page number the citation so that it is very easy for you to flip other 300 400 pages you can just go uh, or from the entire gamut of affairs let me compare the advocacy with a daily activity like learning how to drive a car you know how to ride a motorbike you sit on it it's a narrow one so you know what lies on the left side what lies on the right side and straight away zoom past then you buy a car you want to learn it you sit in the car it's a big one you sit on one corner and it gets extended on your left to a large extent when you try to drive you don't know whether you're tramping on the feet of the people passing by on the left, left left side because you don't have that measure of distance all of a sudden coming to your mind so what you do sometimes you'll put a flag post on the left so extreme left side when you drive you can see the point of flag post on the left side many cars have that provision so that you can know the length of the car where so that you can maintain some uh, put a uh, distance from the passers by and drive it so note taking is like driving a car so initially it is a prompt prop that cannot be dispensed with more so when you write you not only write and you have been reading and remembering and re rewinding yourself so it's something like reading four times as they say whatever it is we were taught that way as children so invariably it is the prop you need it but as you grow in stature in experience i mean stature you grow in experience you will find your style some people feel that Uh, as i give the lecture my style i could say i note down the bullet points then the moment i see the point it triggers the uh, re rest of the expansion or explanation i do that one otherwise if you read every sentence is quite hackney so is the case with preparation in uh, advocacy prepare as a beginner everything meticulously as you grow you can jettison some of the props you have been using because of your expertise so it is an individual comfort but preparing notes is an invaluable quality to begin with but where to stop it's an individual choice so uh, we can have some semblance with the fact that it is just like when we uh, we are going in a, a webinar just like the ppts are the bullet points of the entire yes. uh, webinar it is more just like a ppt but more crispier than the ppt indeed yeah, yes sir so uh, the question and answers can continue and continue it can also happen that we keep on asking the questions it will happen that we will reach tomorrow's webinar which we are having on mediation by honorable mr justice kanan sri ram panchu who did article 3 uh, then on in this ayodhya the honorable supreme court had appointed him to look into the matter and then we have mr jawad they are all experts mediators so we will get a flip into that they are all trying to have a different issues uh so that everybody can have a take he can know what field he can excel where he has to sharpen up himself or herself in that way so it was a wonderful session and we are quite indeed happy and enamored to the fact that uh you have come second time on the platform within a short span but today as i said that we were having large number of participants in the in the wait waiting room itself of the Uh, webinar and for that reason some participants just couldn't enter because they thought that probably we are not allowing them but they were not realizing that there was too much in the waiting room and the computers just couldn't do it in fact one of my computer just crashed because there were too many participants entering that be that as it may sir uh, thank you everyone stay connected stay blessed you can contact us on our face uh, mobile number what we have given on the chat box as well as follow our instagram page as well as the facebook page of beyond law clc to have further updates on webinars those who have missed the any session of ours like the previous session of mr naidu you can just subscribe to the beyond law clc channel along with uh, sapandeep youtube channel 
for for the previous sessions also stay blessed stay connected thank you sir and thank you all the participants thank you very much friends believe in yourself and be the best thank you all the best thank you